Welcome everybody and thanks so much for making your time to attend this launch on Zoom and we're also on Facebook Live which is fantastic. I know many of you are extremely busy, the grass has started growing, course managers are getting ready for golf courses to be back in shape for golfers returning and we're you know it's very exciting but I understand that it's obviously very stressful and everybody's been working particularly hard throughout this pandemic with all the disruption and changes so we really appreciate everybody's efforts to attend this good launch at uh, a very busy time. Just a quick note before we start if everybody could just make sure their mics are muted so that we uh, don't get any interruptions and we will do some questions near the end. But we're very excited to launch HiCure, um, a new biostimulant from Syngenta, so let's get started. Just a quick introduction, my name's Daniel Lightfoot, I'm UK Business Manager um, for Syngenta Professional Solutions for UK and Ireland. And what I wanted to do in this presentation was give a short introduction into the Syngenta long-term strategy and why we're choosing to invest in biocontrol solutions. My colleague, Glenn Kirby, is then going to give an in-depth overview of HiCure and our new biostimulant, how it works and how it can fit into your programme. After that, Henry Bechelet from ICL, who many of you know, will have a chat with Glenn about integrating the product into programmes and what he thinks you should be doing regarding biostimulants in this area. If you put some questions in the chat, I'll monitor them on the way through. And then hopefully we can wrap up the session with some more questions and answers with Henry and Glenn, and then we'll conclude. If there's more questions than we can answer on this session, what we'll do, we will then just go and put um, some questions together and Glenn will answer them in his blog, which I'm sure many of you follow. Integrated turf management, I guess it's a kind of phrase that's on everybody's lips at the moment. And for me, it's always been the most important way of managing turf grass. What we're going to show in the next few slides is how Syngenta plays a part in this area and how ultimately the be it benefits you as a customer and how it helps you manage your turf. I think as a golf course manager, I used to be a golf course manager myself, and a lot of the time you kind of tend to think what's next week, what's the week after, and maybe as far as maybe a year out. But at Syngenta, what we need to do is think that what customers are going to need in the next five years and in the next 10 years. And it's very much important at something like HiCure, where we've been researching this product for a number of years now, at least five. Um, so Glenn's going to show you some of that research. But integrated turf management is important. And I guess many of you will be familiar with the ITM pyramid. In this slide, um, it kind of really shows a, a real fundamental understanding of how turf grass management should be. As I said, I used to be a golf course manager and it feels like a lifetime ago now. But I firmly believe when you're building up any type of turf management program, it needs to start from the bottom. You've got to get the cultural components right, the cutting height, fertility, the holocorin, the scarifying, good mechanical and physical procedures. I think we all know that organic matter measurement is incredibly important for good playing surfaces. For me, as a golf course manager and at Syngenta, these bits are really, really, really important. We have to get the cutting height right and we have to get the holocoring and the scarifying. All of those cultural practices have to come first. However, I think maybe 10 years ago, chemical solutions were probably the next step. They were the next thing that people were looking at. And I think that you've got all of your cultural practices right, and then you looked at what chemical solutions could control some of the other issues that you have. But over the last maybe 10 years, I think that's changed quite a lot. Definitely monitoring and modeling has become really, really, really important. And also we're starting to see a lot more drive towards biological solutions as part of that integrated turf management. For me, a really good example of this kind of development, if you look at moisture meters. I remember when I did my master's degree at Cranfield in oh, 2006, I think, we were looking at uh, moisture meters in agriculture, and I thought they would be a fantastic thing to be able to use on a golf course. And so we bought our first TDI moisture meter, 
And that was there, hardly anyone was using them back then. And now if you look at it with the Pogo and Spectrum Technologies, almost every golf course has got a digital tool to help them manage turf much better. And you can really see how this development in the way we manage turf is becoming much more digital. Also, I think that Glenn and I really understand that while companies like ICL, like Toro, John Deere and, and others really play a part in the bottom two parts of the tier of the, what we're looking at. And for Syngenta, our responsibility and what we're trying to do as part of our strategy is to really focus and deliver solutions on the top part of that tier. That's where we're focused on. That's where we think we can do well. And that's where we think we can really support our customers. Chemical control is still a vital part of our strategy. It's really, really important. The amount of phone calls I've had this week about Celeprin and leather jackets and leather jacket damage shows it's still really, really important for Greenkeeper or for Syngenta to spend time working on good, safe chemical solutions for the industry. They're incredibly time consuming. They're incredibly hard to deliver, but Syngenta is still working incredibly hard to deliver really good chemical solutions for the industry that are safe, that meet all the really tough regulatory requirements and continue to deliver great solutions in this space. We recently had a Cernity launched uh, in UK and Ireland, which is fantastic, a new fungicide. We're continuing to work hard to grow its uh, areas of use. And also we've had, got the emergency approval for a Celeprim for the last few years, and we're really working hard to get a full approval. So we're very, very committed to still making sure we've got good technology. However, I think what's really important is the improvement in digital technology. As you might, some of you may be aware of all of the digital technology we have. And if you just look at this slide here, we've got pest tracker, which we've been working on to really get an understanding of how pests are disseminated around the country and when we can monitor them and how we find out best use for particular products. We've got the GDD calculator. If many of you haven't seen this, the GDD calculator, I was a lazy course manager and I could never be bothered to go and get all the weather data and the high and the low and write it down. I didn't have that kind of application. But here, you don't have to. If you go onto Greencast, it will take the weather data from your location, put in the high and the low, work it all out, and then even send you an email to tell you when to put your next Primo application on. So it does all the calculations for you, even depending on what threshold you want. So another way where digital is really helping. Thirdly, you've got the disease control from Greencast. A lot of our platforms based on Greencast, so it's got disease control, um, disease monitoring, historic disease, weather, all of these things that can really help. And it just doesn't stop there either. I think that if you look in the center of the screen here, what you can see is you can see a satellite management strategy that Syngenta is working on. And we've you know, been working very hard behind the scenes on this. And it was able to do an NDVI image of the golf course, and we will be able to track every day the NDVI value across the whole site. So then if you do different applications to different um, fairways, if you do different things, you can see how the course changes over the year, and we're going to map that for NDVI. The, the holy grail, as it were, is if we can get, we can predict disease before you can see it on the golf course through satellite NDVI, and we're really working hard to do that. So it just shows how digital is becoming really, really, really important. But as the pyramid had you know, three bits where Syngenta had some value, I think this is the other area where we're really working. We're working to develop better biological and biostimulant controls for Syngenta to bring customers much better products than they've ever had in the past in this space. I think for me, if you look in this area, historically, it's always been filled with products that don't have a lot of supporting data, don't have a lot of research. And so as a course manager, even I was in this position, you applied them and hoped that, you know, what it said on the brochure would work or the application was right. Syngenta is going to take a very different approach to biologicals and biostimulants in this area we're going to invest in a massive amount of research on data and in terms of trial work so that what we say we can support anything that we're saying about our products we have the data to back it up 
We're very familiar with how to get a chemical registered and the amount of trial data, and we're having the same R&D approach towards biostimulants in, in this area. So, you know, you can trust that what we're putting in front of you is research driven, it's had lots of trial work, and it's backed with real Syngenta R&D, and hopefully that's what's going to make the difference. Biologicals and biological controls are a really important part of our future strategy. I don't think, and we don't want Syngenta to be seen as a chemical company. It's an R&D company that's delivering digital solutions, chemical solutions, and biological solutions that are really going to help course managers. So for me, now I'm going to pass over to Glenn, who's going to actually talk you through the new biological solution that we've got and how it works. So Glenn, thanks very much for your time. Over to you. Right. Cheers, mate. Um, excellent introduction. And I think it really summarises where we're going to go and what we're trying to do here very nicely. Um, we, I spend a lot of time talking about chemical and increasingly more time looking at biological and biostimulants and digital platforms. But those bottom two tiers of that pyramid, when you put it like that, Dan, it just reminds me how important that foundation is. And although we spend a lot of time talking about those top three parts of that triangle. The bottom bit is incredibly important and should never be neglected. Right, so let's have a little look. Let's see if that's, there we go. So what we're going to talk to you today about is I'm going to look at the role of amino acids and proteins in plants. So that's going to be the first chunk we have a little look at. And then we're going to have a little look at how plants respond to stress and the role of amino acids in a plant's stress response. Uh, then we're going to touch upon high cure. We'll look at what's in the bottle. What does high cure do? And you hopefully what the kind of introduction to amino acids and plant stress responses, you can understand, start to understand how the products fit together. Then we'll have a little look at how we use it to build a stronger plant and the benefits we can achieve. Um, and I've done some user trials with this product over the last couple of years, and I'm going to share some of that information with you. And we're very lucky to have Henry Bechelet from ICL on the call, who's also done some trial work with us uh, looking at Hiker. And I'm going to have a chat to him about the trial work he's done last year, just to look at um, some of the tank mixes that are possible and where we can start sliding it into people's programs. Then we'll jump into some questions that have come from the floor. So if you've got any questions, go on to the chat room, send them over to Dan. Dan's going to pull those together and then fire some questions and me at Henry at the end. And then we'll just wrap up with a quick conclusion. So let's get started. Amino acids and proteins. Um, amino acids are one of those subjects that we probably touched on at GCSE science and then completely forgotten about. And um, whenever it gets mentioned, we all kind of say, yeah, I know what amino acids are. And then we roll on to the next subject. And um, I used to be one of those people. And then I started reading up about it and I realized I knew very little. So I'm going to try and break it down as simple as possible um, in a language or a, a system that you can understand and really be useful for you. So. In its rawest form, an amino acid is a building block. It is that raw building block of a protein. Now, the easiest way I find to understand that is to think of it like a Lego block. One individual Lego block. That's the equivalent of amino acid. Now, there are loads of different amino acids, just like there are loads of different Lego blocks. And the more you bolt these things together, the more you can build. And that's what the plant is trying to do. So it takes its raw amino acids and it starts bolting them together. Now, one of the things, one of the terms that you may hear spoken about when biostimulants are mentioned is a peptide. And you can have short chain peptides and long chain peptides. So they're two, two phrases that sound quite complicated, um, but all they really are is a bunch of Lego blocks bolted together. So the longer the peptide, the more Lego blocks you have bolted together. But they're not a useful thing. A peptide is purely a bunch of blocks bolted together. So a short chain peptide is one or two Lego blocks bolted together. A long chain peptide is 50 odd. But what's the plants trying to do, or what we're trying to do with our Lego, is we're trying to build something. And the plant is trying to build a protein, whereas we're trying to build something with our Lego. And in my situation, 
I've made a stormtrooper head. Yep, I got that one at Christmas and I made that on Boxing Day and I haven't been brave enough to pull it apart yet. So with my Lego, I made a stormtrooper head. Uh, over half term, I made um, the burrow from Harry Potter with my nine-year-old daughter up in her bedroom. That was very nice. I do enjoy my Lego. And what the plant is trying to do is trying to build a useful protein. And it needs proteins because proteins play key roles in the plant. So they're a component of cell membranes. They create antioxidants to counter free radicals. When it's under stress, they provide protection against heat stress. They're key components of chloroplasts and photosynthetic processes. They play a key role in biosynthesis of enzymes. They regulate the function of the membrane. I'm not going to test you on all of this, um, but they do an awful lot within the plant. So we can understand how important proteins are in the plant's physiology. So going back to the amino acid, which is the building block of those proteins, so our raw Lego blocks, they're quite a simple compound. They contain, if you're into your chemistry, they contain two pieces of hydrogen bolted onto some nitrogen, a couple of bits of carbon in there with some more hydrogen. And it is there. And you'll notice there is a nitrogen molecule in there. So every amino acid is built around a nitrogen molecule. Now, the one bit that is the same on all amino acids is this chunk here that you're looking at. But they all have this R leg. And this R leg bolts onto another compound which changes the type of amino acid it is so depending on the type of amino the type of lego block what color it is what size it is how big it is how small that's all how they all have that chemistry bolted onto them and to create those different lego blocks or amino acids um we develop these new things that are needed and there's around 20 of those amino acids that are used in plant protein development and four key ones are proline um, that's an antioxidant that protects against damage you've got glycine you've got glutamic acid and you've got alanine so there are four different amino acids and you know i've been in this game a while and i've heard a awful lot of terms and names used around biostimulants and they're all names that i've heard of before but if i'm honest i didn't really know how all of those connected up so what i'm hoping i've done today is give you an understanding of what an amino acid is which is this raw block what a peptide is which is all of these blocks bolted together what a protein is which is my lego structure that i've built and what may be a proline, a glycine, glutamic acid, they're all different types of Lego blocks. So now we've got a bit of an understanding of what an amino acid and a protein is. I want to look at how the plant uses them in its response to stress. So when the plant is under stress, now we'll take it back a bit, before the plant even gets into a stress, it is very capable of developing its own Lego block. So all the time the plant is fine. It's not under any stress. There's no drought stress. There's no heat stress. There's no extreme lows of light. It's not under unnecessary wear. It is creating all the amino acids it needs to build its own proteins. It does that itself. The challenge comes when a plant comes under stress. When a plant goes into a stress period, you start to see this increase in free radicals within the plant. So it starts to create these free radicals which start sending the signals within the plant that something isn't quite right. We then start to see a reduction in photosynthesis. We then start to see carbohydrate reserves start to deplete. You get respiration, reduce, and less energy is created. And then your N uptake from the soil reduces and your amino acids start to slow down. At that point, the plant still needs to create these amino acids because it's under stress. It's no longer capable of doing itself. What it starts doing at that point is it starts degrading its own proteins, starts pulling apart its own lego structures because it needs these raw building blocks it needs these but it's no longer capable of creating them itself so it has to degrade its own protein structures to generate these to start combating the stress we could see that in the study that we've got here so we did a study looking at 
uh, protein content in the plant over a period of temperatures. And you can see along this bottom axis, we've exposed the plant to 20 degrees, and then we've up that 20 to 25, 20 to 25 to 30, and so on all the way through the scale. And what we have down this axis is the percentage dry weight of protein. And you can see there's a nice trend here as we go through the study, the hotter it gets, the warmer it gets, the more prolonged the temperature it's exposed to, we see this protein degrade. That is the plant pulling its own proteins together, pulling them apart because it can't cope anymore. But what we start to see in that same study when we look at amino acid content, so we start looking at the raw building blocks of those proteins, as we go through the trial, same temperatures, but we're measuring amino acid content this time. We go downhill, but as we get towards the end of the study, we start to lift our content of amino acids. So the plant has broken down its proteins in order to generate these amino acids that it needs. When we're starting to look at an amino acid product that we're delivering to the plant, the objective is to stop that protein degrading. We're trying to get there before it starts pulling its own proteins apart. And what stress does it do this under? So what situations is this going to happen? Well, any stresses, the plant response is the same throughout all the stresses. So whether that be um, abiotic stresses, drought, heat, shade, cold, environmental, nutrition, lean, too lean, air pollution, salinity, additional turf maintenance, heavy wear, all of those abiotic stresses, you will see this same process. And you'll also see it with biotic stresses. Now we talk a lot about abiotic stresses, which are things that happen to the plant through through the environment. And then we also start talking about biotic stresses, so things like disease, pests, and weeds. Now, with a product like High Cure or an amino acid, there are no fungicidal benefits. There are no insecticidal benefits. There is no herbicidal benefits. But what we can do is we can start equipping the plant to cope with those stresses much, much better. So when we're thinking about it, what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop the plant going into this downward stress cycle. And we got a nice study here that supports that. We were looking at the effect of heat stress on this treatment. And you can see some nice images of what we achieved. So untreated, this was not treated with an amino acid or a high cure product compared to the high cure applied at 25 litres on a 14 day interval in this situation. And you can see, Looking at the two plots here, we have managed to reduce the percentage injury on those plots by a decent amount by adding high cure into the program. And it's really nice to see those results on turf. So I've mentioned quite a bit about amino acids and high cure, and I'm just going to delve into a bit more um, what is in that high cure bottle. So in the high cure bottle, we have free amino acids, we have short chain peptides and we have long chain peptides. So we've got loads of Lego blocks or individual broken down by themselves. We've got some short chain peptides, so two or three of them bolted together. And then we've got long chain peptides. So we've got a whole bunch of them bolted together. But what's interesting to look at is the ratio of those in the high cure products. So what we have in this graph is these grey lines in this bar graph over here are the free amino acids. Now, what we've done is we've measured them by molecular weight. So the smaller they are, the lighter they are, the rawer that amino acid, the more it's in its raw form. And we've also got short chain peptides, but we've got very few of these long chain peptides. Now, the kind of purpley graph line there is a standard amino acid breakdown. And what you'll generally see in amino acid products is a far larger percentage of these long chain peptides. Now, the thing is with long chain peptides is they do a job, but they need to get broken down. So if we're delivering these large Lego blocks where there's lots of them bolted together, the plant or the soil has to pull these apart individually before they start getting absorbed by the soil. So the longer the chain peptide, the slower release it is. The shorter it is, the more instantly available it is to the plant. And when we're thinking about that and we want to get the very best out of a product like high cure with lots of short chain peptides and amino acids in there, we want to be targeting it at the leaf because these things are foliar absorbed or quickly roots absorbed. So 
When you're thinking about the stresses and you think about how the plant is going to break things down and the role of amino acids in there and what we have in high cure, we want to be targeting these amino acids at the leaf during this period of stress or running into the period of stress. So the main target is foliar absorption. However, the larger peptides in there, these longer chain peptides, they will get broken down, pulled apart, and that will happen generally in the soil, and then it will get root absorbed and taken up by the plant. So if it goes into the soil, if it is applied with a wetting agent or something like that, or on a program, it's not wasted, it's still used, but it's a much slower release. So in a program type approach, it's a much slower release because it needs to be broken down by the soil and absorbed. Whereas in its shortest chain, as a targeted for stress, it's foliar absorbed. So you just need to think about that when you're building it into your programs. So in that bottle, we have 63% amino acids and peptides from natural origins. Um, around 10% of those are these free rawest building blocks, these individual Lego blocks of free amino acids. There are 18 different amino acids in there that all do a varying number of things within the plant. Uh, it's very high in proline, glycine and glutamic acid, which are important uh, amino acids in the plant structure. And there's around 10% organic N in there. Now it is very slow to react. It's a genuine organic N and it is part of that amino acid molecule. So you can't have an amino acid without nitrogen being part of it. But don't expect quick responses out of that. It is very slow. I'm going to talk to Henry in a bit about how he used it in his some of his trial work that he's done um, alongside kind of Greens Master type products. And you don't see the same form of release as you do a standard nitrogen. It will release, but it's very slow and very gradual. From a rates and a recommendation point of view, um, this isn't like our normal Syngenta products where we have a very specific rate that needs to be used. There is a wider range, but from the work we've done, we've done a lot of research on this now. I think Marcel has done around five years worth of work with this. We've kind of steadied out and stabilized out a recommendation of 20 liters a month through the summer stresses. So if you're looking at things around our nose, drought, heat, high levels of light, and 20 litres a month broken down into whatever spray intervals you do. And then once we move into the autumn stresses, the kind of cooler stresses, which aren't the same kind of impact, around 10 litres a month on a um, split down into whatever intervals you're spraying at. And so you can use it in programmes every two to four weeks, start before stress is expected. Um, use at higher rates for monthly intervals when conditions are more challenging. Uh, it's an excellent tank mix product, so it works really well in amongst products like Primo, particularly things that are foliar absorbed. And I touch base with Henry on some of that and some of the work he's done with that in a little bit. Um, we have tank mixed it with fungicides and we've seen some very nice results. I'm going to share some of that with you in a second. Application rate, 200 to 400 litres a hectare. We want to really get it onto that leaf. That's where we're getting the very best out of it. And obviously we mentioned earlier, but ITM practices, including aeration and nutrition are essential to seeing anything, any results out of these kind of products. So from a high cure point of view, we've got a load of free aminos in there that rapidly enter into the leaf and protect cells, uh, provides this direct source of energy, which can be immediately utilized by plant. It's one of the big benefits for amino acids. It can be used quickly. And high cure is very strong because we've got a very, very large quantity of these free amino acids. And this ability to conserve plant energy that's lost through that nitrogen assimilation when the plant's under stress is really important to getting the very best out of it. So how can we use it in some programs? We've got a bit of data I can share with you here. So some of you will remember the lockdown trial we did at STRI last year. And we were reporting on a regular basis and um, it was a really interesting one to do during lockdown. It was up at STRI in the tropical climate of Yorkshire, and we saw these temperatures throughout the period of that trial. So during the trial, which started uh, mid-June, we were seeing maximum temperatures of around 15 degrees in June. Um, by the end of June, we'd hit the dizzy heights of around 12 degrees. So Yorkshire isn't known for its heat stress. However, 
we got to the end of July and we hit 30 degrees and we got through into August and we had a hot spell in there where we were regularly over 25 degrees. So when we were looking at this from a trial point of view, we started to see some of those stresses, some of those heat stresses towards the middle of this trial. Now in this trial, we were looking at high cure and rider in a tank mix, and we were looking to see how it would cope with these summer stresses. And the untreated control, rather than being unfair and trying to find a way of force some results, we were tank nitrogen tank matching it or nitrogen matching it to a Greens Master liquid program. Now, the Greens Master liquid program is a lot of people's go to product, it's an excellent fertilizer, and it's a kind of staple diet of people's programs. So we were seeing here a turf quality rating throughout this trial of between six and six and a half all the way through. We had a bit of a drop through here, but we were back up there quite quickly. Um, when we put the Haikyuu Rider treatment in over the top of that, what we saw at the beginning of the trial was a very similar result. So all the time we were in this kind of nice temperature range where there were no stresses, there were very little differences between the two treatments. However, once we started to hit these high temperatures, these high stresses, things started separating out a little bit. Now we've got a couple of things going on here. So as we were entering into that stress period, we had these programs in place. We hit a bit of stress and the Greens Master program hasn't really dipped off but it's just kind of stayed there. Whereas using the amino acids and the rider in there, what we managed to do is negate some of that heat stress. We put the plant in a much better position to cope with the stress from the heat. It didn't need to break down its own proteins to deliver amino acids. And on the back of that, we came out much stronger. Um, so there, it's not a case of one program or the other. When we look at these things, we're trying to figure out how we bolt these together to get the very best out of it. But in that trial, works really nicely. Now, one of the areas we can see amino acids becoming really increasingly important for is anfracnose management. Now, that's important, not because amino acids have any kind of impact on anfracnose, they don't, but we know anfracnose is a stress-related disease. So if we look at a trial we did in 2017 at STRI with this, and we're measuring turf quality here, the untreated control plot in this anfracnose study, was showing that we were moving along nicely from the middle of June uh, around a turf quality um, score of around five and then mid-July we started to drop due to anthracnose pressure. This was in the untreated control. By adding high cure in there and in this situation we were using 10 litres every 28 days, um, what we managed to do was stabilise those results a bit more. So we kept the turf quality score going a bit longer. We were entering into that anfracnose pressure around the middle of July. And by the middle of August, we were holding onto that turf quality with the high cure, but we still dropped off. So this is a kind of indication of what we can expect with these kind of products. Uh, they are not game changers, but build them into good programs and we start to see results. And what we also did in here, we had a fungicide trial going on. And you can see from the fungicide trial that we saw an uplift again. Not a huge uplift, but we know that anthracnose problems are one of the biggest challenges that we have in the industry. So we've got some nice results here. We've seen a bit of a step forward in turf quality throughout the season. And we were definitely in a much better place once we got through to the middle of September. But when we start bolting these things together, we see these big gains. So the green line that I've just added in here was the high cure and the fungicide program strapped together. And we saw this big uplift in turf quality to start with, and we maintained it for a much longer period. So when we start to look at amino acids and products like this, we've got to understand how they become very strong tank mix partners for other products to get more out of them to help us move that plant into a much better place. So that was at STRI. Um, what I managed to do was do a trial looking at plant health benefits and the incremental gains we could gain on a golf course looking at microdocium. And this was a trial I did in 2019. Corhampton Golf Club is just down the road from me. So I have a chance to go in and do some work with Yester there and actually do some recording, which is nice. 
And what I've got in front of you there is an untreated control at the top in the blue. So from a disease perspective, down this left-hand side, oh, let me go back to that, this left-hand side here, this is our disease percentage. Now the disease percentages look quite low. The highest we got was around 6%, but I'll show you in a minute how I, me how I measured that so we can see what that actually looked like. So our untreated control, we were hitting around 6% disease at the end. Uh, the two lines here, the black and the gray, were high cure in integrated strategy. So it's not high cure by itself, it was high cure tank mixed with low rates of Culebra, because I was looking to see if I could roll leaf moisture off, could we reduce disease pressure? And uh, we also had rider in there as well, because we were trying to understand the benefits of that. So it's an integrated strategy um, on a monthly and a two weekly basis. And we did manage to reduce disease pressure in this situation from 6% down to a kind of three and a half percent. In this situation, there was no difference between the monthly application and the fortnightly application. But the fungicide treatment in the red did what it always does and shows us these big, big gains. Now, I also did a combination of the two in the green line there, and we looked at this high cure integrated strategy alongside the fungicide. And it looks like there's not a lot of gain when you look at the figures. But what I did with this trial is I recorded it all with my tiddlywink method. So I took my plastic discs in, and every time I went and visited, I plotted the disease in these plots. And we had a look at it. Now, this is what 6%, a genuine 6% disease looks like. If you look at the end there at the 10th of December, uh, that is averaged out at 6%. So this bottom one here may well be closer to 10%. This one may be closer to 2%. But across those four plots, that's 6% disease. When we look at the monthly integrated strategy with no fungicide, we did manage to reduce it. We were reducing this by around 40%. But it's still not good enough for turf managers to be happy with this. It wouldn't feel like a success by itself. And you can see, although it's a 40% control, which is great news, 40% reduction still looks like this, which is not an acceptable level of control for most turf managers out there. By moving it to the fortnightly basis of the programme, so same rate, so twice as much, you can see still we had a lot of disease around. It's still around 40% reduction from the untreated control. There's still too much. And generally, if this was the results we were delivering, I'd probably be getting some phone calls and being asked if I could come in and give them some more support. Now, the fungicide program by itself completely delivered. Um, we got very high levels of control here. You can see we started this program um, from a point of some disease. So we were trying to get things back under control. And by the end, we had very low levels of disease in here. But you can see there is still disease about. Now, compared to the untreated control and even the ITM programs, this looks amazing. But if this is by itself with no untreated control plot to gauge it by, there are some customers out there that would still be disappointed with this level of control. Now, in reality, that's 98% disease reduction from the untreated control just with the fungicide. But we're looking for something more than that. Most of our customers are looking for that next level. And combining this high cure program with this fungicide program, we managed to get complete control. Now, there's all sorts of elements to that. We've got the additional benefits of Rider in there, which is helping us put in a better position through reducing plant stress. We have got the Quilibra in there, which was moving a bit of moisture around and putting us in a better position. And we have got the high cure in there. So that's doing a job and improving plant health during these stress periods. And we have delivered that extra 2% that the customers are after in this situation of reducing us down to zero. So we rolled this out the following year onto the golf course because plot trials are great, but we wanted to look at how this really works. And we went across the whole golf course, except for half of the spare green. So this, I think, is, is spare green. I think he calls it spare seven, something like that. And the left hand side was not treated with high cure. The right hand side was treated with high cure. And I went in and tried to visit as much as I could and really look at it. And it was really interesting. Now, every time I went to visit, there was evidence of disease about. Now it was still integrated with this fungicide strategy, 
The difference was in the area with no high cure, it always felt like it was four or five days more advanced than the untreated side. Four or five days of just additional growth. There was still evidence of it on both sides, but it was just staging up. Now, what it seems to do is it just seems under that stress, under that period of disease pressure, just puts the plant in a much better position to resist and back off and just be healthier. So when the fungicide comes along, it's in a much better position to receive that fungicide and react quicker with it. So high cure by itself isn't going to solve disease problems. What it's going to do, you bolt it in amongst fungicide programs and it's going to put you in a much stronger position to be in a better position the following year or in the following period. So kind of from a, a, an overview point of view, that's where we are. Now, one of the things we did is um, working very closely with ICL. We recognize there's a lot of tank mix partners with this. And um, we gave Henry as much product as we could to ask him to have a look at how he could integrate that into some trials. So, uh, Henry, if you're out there. I am here, Glenn. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Oh, very good. Excellent. Thank you for joining us today, Henry. All right, my pleasure. Um, on the back of last year, you did some kind of extensive trial work looking at high cure in tank mixes. Um, is there anything you learnt out of that? Anything that you kind of key points that you could share with us today? Yes, as, as part of the ICL and Syngenta partnership, uh, we carry out quite a lot of joint trial work um, and keep in touch with each other because, you know, we're constantly looking to give the very best advice in terms of product usage. And so last year I set up a, a tank mix trial um, to look at how high cure might sit in amongst uh, routine summer liquid applications. Okay, so it was a golf green trial, USGA type over at Harrogate Golf Club on their spare, uh, on their spare hole. So thanks to them always. Um, it started in June. It was kind of delayed, actually, as a result of the lock lockdown. We would have got going um, earlier if we'd have been able. But we started in June, and it went actually went right through to the end of December. So I kind of gave it a really good look and and really sort of familiarised myself with the product. Um, it was a quite a robust trial design, plot based um, block design for replications, and I'd be assessing. Uh, for turf colour, turf quality, NDVI and disease on a weekly basis. And then I'd send you a, uh, a video clip, Glenn, um, moaning about the summer weather, generally. Um, now, in the trial, there was, there, was, there was three phases, three distinct phases. There was a sort of period of pre-trial stress. Um, when lockdown started um, in sort of March, uh, this time last year, wasn't it? Uh, Mid-March, we sort of had quite a warm and dry spell of weather. And that continued until the start of June. And um, by which time, you know, a certain amount of turf stress had built. Um, but then, of course, it started raining. As soon as I applied my treatments, <laughs> the stress conditioning of turf, we had a very poor summer. It wasn't like you down in the south of England, Glenn. We had a, up in Yorkshire, you know, like Bingley, you've seen the Bingley results, mm. uh, pretty poor summer. But so we'll call that a period of recovery. Um, and then in autumn, we had a sort of period uh, where we would sort of be looking at disease or those kind of biotic stresses. So, so there were some phases in the trial. And, and, and actually what I was looking at was partnering high cure with other products, you know, integrating them in the way that you were describing with other products that also have stress mitigation, stress management um, attributes. So Prima Max 2 plant growth regulator, C-Max, um, seaweed, concentrated seaweed extract, rider turf pigment and of course just green master liquid um, you know nutrition and mm -hmm. um, just in various ways partnering everything up and we definitely saw some really good treatment effects even with high cure on its own even though it wasn't a particularly stressful period you could see the benefit that it was bringing in terms of turf color and turf quality but it was when you did put it um, with those other partners and you and you built up your sort of integrated stress management uh, cocktail that's when those real benefits came in and we were achieving like really excellent levels of turf color turf quality NDVI everything else 
during the summer, but without tricking it up with loads of nitrogen, for instance. It was, um, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was really good, and, and the great results really did come from those co combinations. But yeah, you've mentioned a kind of uh, a number of interesting technologies there, Henry, with kind of PGRs and seaweeds and pigments. There's a number of things there which are really low or almost non-existent nitrogen. Mm. That are putting plants in a much stronger position to cope with things. So there will be a lot of people out there now thinking, well, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's a lot of questions and variables there. Have you got any advice or thoughts on how they could go about building those programs and how they go about timing them so they get them in the right place at the right time? Yeah, and, and, and you know, with, with all the partners that we put into the trial, Glenn, they're all sort of fairly routine treatments. We weren't trying to sort of make, a, you know, something that was unrealistic. We were trying to partner the high cure with... Um, you know, with products that people would routinely um, be using because, you know, high is not a standalone product, is it? Um, the trick with it is going to be to integrate it into your sort of wider uh, uh, ITM or sort of integrated stress management approaches. So, I mean, you've, you, you've said already, Glenn, that the sort of the key learnings that I that very much chimed with me during the course of my trial is kind of like, well, first of all, you have to kind of partner them or apply it as part of a sort of your foliar application program. So it would be a part of your liquid feeds or your, your Primo program. Um, and applying it, the timing seems to be everything. You know, we've got to sort of prevent those plants from degrading its own protein. So, you know, a bit applying it at the onset of stress, which I didn't do in my trial, actually. My trial was monthly applications. There were sort of limitations to that. And, but as we learn, we sort of, um, as, as we go on, we learn, don't we? And so, so this year, I think I'll be looking at those timings um, and partnering them with sort of, you know, those, those, those products that, that also are acting towards the same goal so yeah definitely primo max definitely folio fees rider c max stress buster seems to be an obvious partner but you know you mentioned there the, the fungicides they seem to be it seems to be a, a a kind of a good mix there so i think overall for me i, I would sort of say look it's a it's a flexible addition to your routine programs depending on conditions now in yorkshire we might not you know see any sun this year but down south you know that you know you're constantly in these kind of conditions and so so it might be sort of depending on your sort of location would be would depend on you know when you go in with um with the high cure when you sort of deploy it um, those rates of application, I'd just sort of like to confirm those because they're sort of 20 litres per hectare per month would be the recommendation, you know, split between treatments if you're uh, applying on a regular basis for summer heat and drought stress and then 10 litres per hectare per month during the autumn winter disease sort of biotic stress period. But because everyone's programmes are different, we do need to do, you know, constantly more trial work. Um, to be able to sort of test all the different variables and to find out how to get those benefits because stress mitigation or stress management is huge in terms of um, turf maintenance, isn't it? And so, so, you know, having another tool to do the job is, is really important to us. We've just got to find out more and more how to use it to its very best. Yeah, you, you touched on a couple of really good points there, Henry. I think uh, when we're thinking about stress management, we've mentioned heat quite a lot in this one. And um, you're right, you're not always blessed with the temperatures that maybe we get down south up there. But there's more stresses going on than just heat stress on there. We're looking at regularly see people pushing cutting heights further than they should, additional rolling, having to push plants in order to get the putting surfaces they want. There are a number of different stresses and uh, mm. drought stress is another one we could talk about for all day long. Um, so delivering it at the time when stress is going on, I think is important. But let's not forget that it is kind of, there's two elements to this. So in a program, uh, it really does play a use in a program because even if it's applied on a monthly basis, building up into a stress period, you've still got that breakdown of the longer chain stuff going on in the soil. So these aminos being delivered in a much slower form. It's just not that really pinpoint making the very best of those short chain peptides and amino acids. Yeah. 
So there's a lot to learn still. Um, got any plans for next year, this year? Yes. Well, I mean, I think that we, we, we yeah, and, and you're right there, Glenn. You know, I'm very much looking at pinpointing at the moment, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but yeah, I want to pinpoint those timings. I want to pinpoint the best partners and those rates of application. Just tight, and I need to tighten up my, my trial design, really. I kind of need, this year, I need less treatments, more replications, because I kind of want to get those really strong relationships showing. Um, you know, it'd be nice to have a bit more stress. I take your point, you know, a golf green, for instance, is a highly stressed environment anyway. So um, what we're talking about is mitigating deterioration when, you know, additional stress is just ramp up to that sort of point of real pressure. So, so that's fine. But it would be nice to have some stress in Yorkshire. Uh, a hot summer this year would be, would be most welcome. But and, and hopefully we can kind of, uh, you know, just build the picture. This is what we do, isn't it, Glenn? You know, we don't just launch a product. We, we support products and and constantly look to just add the information to help people to get the best out, the best out of them. Yeah, we, we've done a lot of work already to date, but it, it doesn't finish there. Now we've launched it. That's just the beginning. And I think we've got high cure. I hope we've got high cure for a long time and there'll be a whole host of work to continue supporting it, which um, wraps up pretty much the presentation today. Now, I'm hoping Dan has had a few questions. That yeah, yeah, I have, Glenn. So uh, I... Yeah, look, uh, brilliant presentation, guys. Great to listen to um, your thoughts on it. There was a couple of questions, well, it's quite a few questions, and probably they came around two key themes. The first theme was from Dr. Kate Entwistle and Colin Fleming. So you're going to have to be right on your metal for this one. We're, at the, we're, we're working at the top level here. So both of them asked a similar question on timing applications. And when do you need to time it? You've touched on it already, but when do you need to time the applications before how far in front of the stress do you think? Marcella wrote in the chat that two applications has seemed good. And the closer you get to the stress, the more variable the, the results. And if you go, you know, so which would which would make sense. You want to you know, have a nice you know, built in preventative strategy. But I just wondered on your thoughts in terms of, you know, how you manage that timing, how you manage when the stress is coming and what you think about how many apps, you know, before, before, you know, just because course managers need to have that in their mind and thinking on the horizon about what's coming. Yeah, uh, no, it's, um, it's a great question and a very good point. And I think one of the things that we're looking at with high cures, we do have this wide range of amino acids and short chain and long chain peptides in there. So unlike some products that are out there that are all long chain where you've got to be well ahead of it, the soil has got to break that down. It needs to be absorbed into the plant. We do get some benefits when we're right close into that stress period. But in the build up as well, you get the benefits out of the longer chain peptides. So this is about getting into a program and delivering it on the build up to that stress period. So yeah, Marcel has done a lot more work on it than I have. And I've looked through some of her trial work, but I haven't scratched the surface on the amount of stuff she's looked at. And uh, that feels about right to me, two free applications running into that stress period. So if you know that your kind of amphracnos pressure period comes June, then you wanna be building yourself a program from the beginning of May running into that period, because that's the period you're gonna be coming under stress. Yeah, I, th I think for me, you know, um, <laughs> subsequent question, it's like question time here, I get a subsequent question. I think, um, Henry, I think we really focused this on anthracnose was a key driver here when we looked at the product and we looked at where it can work. So, you know, do you think, so anthracnose, how, how would somebody kind of think about when they get their anthracnose or potentially that issue, which seems to be more and more these days, how would we then, how would they then think about that and then build in their, their pressure if they were thinking about anthracnose specifically? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of drivers for anthracnose and there's, and there's sort of a lot of those drivers are in the hands of the greenkeeper or course manager, aren't they, in terms of sort of heights of car, um, you know, level of top dressing, those kind of things. And um, so you can't just think of it in terms of sort of products. You have to kind of think about... Um, sort of preventing or reducing the uh, potential for anthracnose to, to develop um, with everything that you do. But certainly nutrition is a big part of it. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, it's, it, I mean, Glenn showed some results that sort of seem to, um, seem to show that anthracnose has got a part to play 
with it um, as well as um, fungicide. So, you know, there's a big picture associated with anthrax nose. And, and I think, I, I suppose the key is, is to, to realize that actually um, it doesn't just happen by accident. It happens as a consequence of a lot of the things sort of building sort of pressure over time. Some of them external climatic, some of them maintenance. And you've just got to do your best in every area to, to understand how that sort of situation is building and to sort of back off when you need to. Great. Look, thanks. I think it takes us back to that triangle that we saw at the beginning, where it was very much about the cultural control first, cutting high fertility and really dealing with the things at the bottom first and, and then working your way up. Um, one, one last thing that was a kind of key theme, a couple of people asked it early on, was about grass type. Um, I think it's a big subject. So I <laughs> volunteered you for a blog on this subject, Glenn, about the difference of application on, on grass type. But have you seen in the trials, you know, that it's affected different grasses differently, where it would work on different grasses differently or in mixed wards, maybe there's any difference in terms of reaction, benefit, suppressant, and anything that you might have seen. I, I haven't seen anything myself, but I wondered if you guys having worked with it a bit closer might have seen any changes regarding grass type with application of the product. Uh, yeah, thanks for volunteering me for that one, Dan. Um, that is a big old subject, isn't it? Um, difficult to tease that out from the trial work we've done, I would say. Uh, my gut feeling is I've probably seen more in POA than I have anything else. And that is generally because POA enters into a period of stress first out of the grass species. Um, so no, I, I don't have a really strong answer for you on that. Uh, I've got a gut feeling, but the kind of role of amino acids in plants will be the same, whether that be POA, whether it be fescue or whether it be a, a palm tree. The, the process is the same. Um, it's more about the level of stress that's being imparted. And um, yeah, no, I've not seen anything strong and obvious, but I will do some dig deeper digging on that one. Yeah, good, because it was an important, it came up a few times. Uh, Henry, did you want to add anything on that? Absolutely not. I've got no idea what the uh, relationship is uh, there. You'd think that there would be uh, species uh, differences going on. You know, certain species have different um, sort of adaptations towards stress, don't they, than others, um, and maybe even varietal differences going on. Um, but um, just shows you that the sort of need for research is never ending. No, I think that was what I was going to say. I think that, it, you know, we've done so much, you know, four or five years worth of research on this so far. And it just kind of frames where we're going to continue to go. As Glenn said, it doesn't stop here. We're just going to continue to do more work. We have got a lot of stuff that we can then share on the on the back of the questions. And if you've got any more questions, I've put my email into, into the chat. But I'll just leave Glenn to tidy all the um, information up as a conclusion. Thank everybody for coming and pass it over to Glenn to finish off the presentation. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, let me share my screen again. So yeah, we've seen some really nice stuff with um, Hikia. We've got around five to six years worth of research. And I'm gonna share just a couple of the highlights of that. Um, in some of the studies we've done, we've seen up to around a 300% increase in root mass in glass house plot trials. So the potential for biostimulants is huge. Now this is an extreme, it's a glass house trial, but these are the kind of things that can be achieved. Uh, we've seen up to 50% damage reduction in heat stress situations. Again, in glass house trials, but these are the powers of biostimulants. If you get them right and you fine tune things, we can see some really, really big results. And we've seen some really nice turf color improvements in stressed periods. Now, we're not always gonna see these in the real world, but the potential for biostimulants is huge down the line. And we're hopefully we're at the beginning of this kind of unlocking process of some really deep and good research into biostimulants, not just high cure, but in biostimulants in general. And it's great to be working for a company that are starting to really commit to this and have the resources to do this good high level research on a decent footing going forward. Um, I think to summarise Hikia, 
it's all about maintaining turf quality and challenging conditions. I'm going to be realistic with you here. You're not going to apply high cure on a Monday, come back on Wednesday and go, wow, that's the product for me. It's amazing. Everything looks fantastic. What we're looking to do with products like high cure is maintain turf quality during stressful periods. So if you're going into a stressful period, we're hoping to keep you at the same place rather than seeing it drop off a cliff. We're trying to hold you there. So these are marginal gains. There are lots of marginal gains that we're beginning to work on here, but these marginal gain products bolt them together and they become more than the sum of their parts. And I think this is what Henry was seeing in his Harrogate trial. Once you start bolting things like pigments, amino acids, C max kind of seaweed type products together and you get the timings right you can get some really big gains without throwing nitrogen at those plants it's a great product really looking forward to working with people on it really looking forward to doing some more research um help help you get your turf to perform through difficult periods faster more effective recovery we are really excited to be launching it um there's a load we don't know about it i'm going to be honest biostimulants is absolutely huge but we continue to commit to doing the research if you've got any questions on the back of today that we haven't covered if they're in that chat box i'm going to do my best to cover them in our blog but if you've got any questions over and above that that you haven't had a chance to ask or you've popped up in your head tonight then drop me an email on glenn.kirby at syngenta.com or dan over there at Dan daniel.lightfoot at syngenta.com we'll do our best to get back to you look into it throw it into the melting pot of the next bit of research we do thank you very much for joining us today particular thank you to henry for coming and joining us sharing his trial work for last year um like i say get in touch if you want any more help or assistance with it or if you've got any thoughts and uh, look forward to catching up with you all soon thanks guys